My uh, four-year-old son's favorite bedtime story is the adventures of Pinocchio. Uh, in it, you have the avuncular puppeteer who has a lifelong struggle with this impetuous little puppet who craves to be a boy. And while Pinocchio has some adventures without uh, Geppetto, uh, it is clear that uh, Geppetto's influence on Pinocchio is tremendous, and that this is especially in early life. Now, I've come to see certain parallels between this childhood story and the relationship that our gut, and in particular the bacteria, or what we call the microbiota within our gut, has with in sculpting our brain and behavior. Indeed, uh, in medicine in general, the disciplines of microbiology and neuroscience have evolved in almost parallel trajectories with very little uh, overlap. However, uh, with huge advances in sequencing technology and metagenomics and big data, barriers are being broken down. And now we're beginning to realize that uh, uh, many aspects of host physiology, metabolism, and even behavior are determined by the composition of bacteria within our gut. And while it might sound a bit bizarre, they, uh, these bacteria could be the master puppeteers of our brain and our body. Bizarre? Well, I don't know if you know that you are not human at all. In terms of genes, you are 99% microbial. We have far more bacterial cells in our body uh, than human cells, and our gut microbiota weighs about three pounds, which is about the same as our brain. Um, I'm a stress uh, neurobiologist, and, and I've been working on how stress, is, uh, especially stress at particular epochs in time, be it early in life, in adolescence, or in, in old age, uh, impacts the brain and the body. And uh, it might be somewhat surprising uh, why I've now started to work in the field of microbiota. We're particularly interested in why on this roller coaster of life, uh, if two people are subjected to the same stimuli, why they might respond in very different ways. Of course, genetics plays a role, but there are many other factors. And one of these could be the microbiota in their gut. Now, how did I get into this? Well, a number of years ago, together with my colleagues uh, Ted Dynan and Siobhan O'Mahony uh, in Cork, uh, we showed that um, Animals that were subjected to uh, uh, stress in early life, when they grew up, they had a very different um, microbiota. Moreover, this was in line with previous data from Japan, which showed that if you had animals that grew up without microbes, these are called germ-free animals, they had an exaggerated stress response. So what we've become to appreciate is that stress affects your microbes, and you need your microbes for adequate uh, stress response. So could we use the microbiome to look for specific interventions that might be useful for stress-related disorders? And that brings us to the field of uh, of probiotics, uh, um, a field that has been quite maligned uh, uh, for due reason, but it's a field that's an old field that was discovered over 100 years ago when the Nobel Prize winner, Eli Mechnikoff, he realized later in his career that people who lived in parts of uh, what's now Bulgaria, that they seemed to live longer. And he put this longevity down to the fact that they ate a lot of fermented uh, 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 foods with bacteria in them, especially lactic acid bacteria. Now, this elixir of life that he put forward, is, is, it sounds very far-fetched and is, but we are now beginning to realize that there are certain bacteria that could actually promote uh, positive effects on mental health. And we call these psychobiotics. 
Um, a lot of the work has been generated to date in animal studies, and uh, a lot of it uh, has shown that certain species of lactobacilli and of um, bifidobacteria can have positive effects on anxiety, stress, and uh, cognitive uh, function. Um, for example, um, we uh, showed in animals that if you gave them a lactobacillus rhamnosus, that they uh, uh, and tested them in behavioral assays uh, of stress, that they responded as if they were already on Valium or on Prozac. When we looked at their stress hormone response, it, it was blunted. They were much more chilled out and relaxed. And probably most surprisingly, when we looked at the brains, that there were widespread changes in key brain areas involved in emotion in the neurotransmitter receptor for GABA. Now, GABA is the molecular target for uh, Valium. So all of this is very interesting, but the question is, is how? How can bacteria in your gut signal to the brain? And as this is a wired conference, I thought it's good to put it in the context of circuits and wiring. And we're slowly trying to uh, uh, really uh, disentangle these mechanisms uh, that we have. Uh, we know that the bloodstream, the immune system uh, are, 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 are crucial, uh, and we know the variety of metabolites that are produced by bacteria are, are, are important. But we also know that there is the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve carries a lot of the sensory signals from the periphery to the brain. And together with John Bienenstock's group in uh, Canada, we perform vagotomy and cut this basically communication highway. And in doing so, we blocked all of the behavioral and the physiological and the neurochemical effects of this lactobacillus uh, in these mice. So this tells us that what happens in Vegas doesn't just stay in Vegas, <laughs> but will affect our emotions. It, it, it is important to note uh, that uh, most of the studies to date are, have been done in animals, and we are far away from having clinically proven uh, psychobiotics. Uh, there have been some really exciting uh, early studies using human brain imaging, and we're doing some EEG studies as well, showing that, that, that some of these effects do translate. But we need to be quite cautious. Moreover, uh, the mechanisms uh, that how uh, one bacteria will have a potential positive effect on emotion and another have no effect really needs to be worked out because most bacteria will not have any positive effect on, uh, on brain uh, function at all. And we need to uh, look at this uh, in much more uh, detail. However, it is an exciting time in this field, and we're beginning to appreciate that this microbiota, gut, brain axis is very important for uh, maintaining homeostasis. And perhaps like Geppetto and Pinocchio, the, this is most evident early in life. And we and other um, groups in, in uh, Sweden and in Canada have shown that if you take these germ-free animals that have never had bacteria in their, in their gut and you look at their brains, that they have re really uh, deficits in neurodevelopment. They have wide-scale behavioral changes uh, uh, and uh, changes uh, in key brain neurotransmitter uh, systems. We, um, one interesting thing that we began to notice was that these effects seem to be much more robust in males than females. And that was kind of intriguing. And so that led us to somewhere uh, that we hadn't uh, really worked on before, which was in the area of brain uh, uh, disorders that are more prominent in males than females, specifically uh, disorders of, of social behavior, uh, be it autism or schizophrenia. And so we decided to test whether these germ-free animals would have any, uh, uh, whether the microbiota in the gut would have any role in social behavior. Now, to do this, we used a three-chamber test, uh, which allows a mouse time to explore another mouse or an empty chamber. And mice, like humans and most mammals, are quite social, so they'll prefer to spend time with another mouse than uh, an empty chamber. Not if they're germ-free. 
There, there was no difference uh, at all and weren't able to distinguish. In terms of social cognitive processes for what it is in mice, uh, we, uh, mice are able, uh, like some humans, they're a bit fickle. So if you give them the chance of spending time with a novel mouse or a familiar mouse, they'll want to go to the novel playmate and, uh, and spend more time there. But again, not if they're germ free. We also looked at repetitive behaviors, and this was also increased in these mice. Further evidence for uh, microbiota and social uh, behavior comes from uh, studies from Holland and from, um, and from California, which showed that if mice were exposed to um, either infection in pregnancy or in um, the anticonvulsant agent valproate, both of these which are known risk factors for autism in humans, uh, that these mice, uh, when they grow up, they have difference in their microbiota, differences in their gastrointestinal function, and differences in behavior. And perhaps most surprisingly of all is a study from Caltech, which uh, was published in Cell, uh, uh, and showed that if these mice in, in, were given uh, a single bacteria, a Bacteroides fragilis, early in life, it could reverse many of these gastrointestinal and behavioral uh, problems relevant to uh, autism. However, as I said, it's still early days, and we need to uh, be able to um, work at some of the mechanisms uh, that are potentially uh, involved. So where is the field going? Well, one of the most uh, exciting uh, other areas in uh, microbiome-based uh, medicine is the concept of fecal microbiota transplantation. Yeah, you heard me right. Uh, taking someone else's poo. Would you do it? <laughs> well, you might if you had been diagnosed with resistant C. difficile infection. Clostridium difficile, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, people who are resistant to, to treatment will die. And a couple of years ago, studies emerged showing that if you had a fecal transplant, there was up to a 90% success rate. Now, we've heard a lot today, but in medicine, 90% success rates are not something you come across every day. So in most uh, gastrointestinal ce uh, centers around the world now, uh, uh, they are looking at uh, fecal transplantation, and they are looking at more um, patient-friendly, aesthetic ways of uh, delivering uh, this uh, medicine. And it's also expanding out into other areas of uh, gastrointestinal and inflammatory diseases. And the question is, is it having any impact in relation to brain health? And uh, to my knowledge, nothing has emerged yet in the clinical literature. Uh, but there is this really intriguing study that came from Canada a couple of years ago in animals. And here they looked at um, two strains of mice that differed very significantly in their anxiety behavior. You had this really anxious animal, uh, a, 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 w which is the Balb sea mouse, and, and, and a very low anxious. And then when they looked at their microbiome, it was quite different. And then what they did was to prove that there was a relationship, they did a fecal transplant. And this transplant was able to completely turn the um, uh, uh, more anxious animal into uh, the less anxious and vice versa. So if this uh, could, this is, uh, could be reproduced in humans, it has huge uh, um, uh, uh, ram ramifications because least of all is if any of you ever got Clostridium difficile and needed a fecal transplant, uh, you better be careful of the psychological profile of your donor. Just, <laughs> just in case. So um, we are in, we're at a stage uh, now uh, that we are beginning to realize how important the microbiome is. In the last century, we focused all our efforts on killing microbes with antibiotics. And now we're realizing that for health, for health reasons, we need to keep a healthy microbiome. And this also may extend to brain health. And we need to be careful about uh, factors in lifestyle that are, will impinge on this. And these factors include uh, 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 bad diet, uh, being born by cesarean section, uh, antibiotic use, um, also uh, um, 
hyper cleanliness in, in society in general. And we need to be able to uh, keep a very clear uh, consciousness that our brains are also uh, influenced by what's going on uh, in the periphery. And this is really just a, a beginning of a paradigm shift in neuroscience. And slowly, we're beginning to really uh, appreciate uh, the importance of the microbiome. And we have a lot of work to do, especially in human studies. There needs to be a lot more effort uh, in this to try and see how much of this we can validate from the animal studies uh, at this point. But it somewhat reminds me of these um, TV shows, like Upstairs, Downstairs, or Downton Abbey. And here you have uh, two populations living in the same uh, stately house uh, who require each other to survive. The posh people upstairs uh, somewhat trying to ignore uh, the other people uh, downstairs. And it's, but it's only when things start to go wrong downstairs that the real drama occurs. <laughs> so my message to you today is uh, if the microbiome is uh, powerful enough to modulate our brain and our behavior, imagine what else it could do. Imagine, we still don't know how many strings this puppeteer is pulling. Thank you.